ஹலோ எவ்ரிவான் வெல்கம் டு மெக் டைரிஸ் ஐ எம் ஆரதி லங்கோ செகண்ட் இயர் மெடிக்கல் ஸ்டூடெண்ட் யூனிவர்சிட்டி ஆஃப் ஜெப்னா ஹியர் ஐ ஆம் கோன் ஆஃப் பி ப்ரெசன்ட் அபவுட் த அனாட்டமி ஆஃப் த ஈஸ் ஆஃப் எகஸ் கிளினிக்கல் மேனிஃபெஸ்டேஷன் ஆஸ் வெல் ஆஸ் த கொஷன்ஸ் டூ ஹியர் வி கோ ஃபஸ்ட் ஆஃப் ஆல் ஃபார் த ப்ரீஃப் இன்ட்ரடக்ஷன் ஈஸ் ஆஃப் எகஸ் இஸ் அ லாங் நேரோ மஸ்கியூலர் டியூப் ஃபார்மிங் த ஃபுட் பெசேஜ் விட் பீன் த ஓரோ ஃபேரிங்ஸ் அண்ட் த ஸ்டொமக் இட் இஸ் நியர்லி டுவெண்ட்டி ஃபைவ் சென்டிமீட்டர் இன் லென்த் but we have to clearly define where to where it is you can see here there is a vertebral column and the trachea in between the esophagus is here so the esophagus begins in the neck in front of the prevertebral fascia at the lower border of the cricoid cartilage and then it's descend down from the superior mediastinum to posterior mediastinum and then it pierces the diaphragm at the level of T10 vertebra and then it opens into stomach by the cardiac orifice at the level of T11. Esophagus is not a straight tube. It has some lateral curvatures and the anteroposterior curvatures. If you see from the lateral view, you can see the anteroposterior curvatures. These curvatures follow the curvatures of the vertebral column. In the cervical region, it is anteriorly convex and in the thoracic region, it is anteriorly concave. If you view from the anterior aspect, you can see the two shallow left curvatures. This is the midline. Esophagus commences at the midline and then it inclines slightly left to the midline and enters the thoracic inlet. At the level of T5, esophagus returns to midline and stays at the midline until the level of T7. and then at the level of t7 it again take a left and curve forward to pierce the diaphragm 2.5 cm left to the midline now it's time to go inside the lumen of the esophagus if you see the lumen of the esophagus it's not having the linear diameter everywhere it's having some constrictions the distance of the constrictions from the incisor teeth is very important to remember If we know the normal anatomy only we can diagnose the abnormal things we have four main constrictions in the esophagus first one is at the commencement of the esophagus where we have the cricopharyngeal muscle which is 15 cm from the incisor teeth second constriction is 22 cm from the incisor teeth where it is crossed by the arch of aorta third constriction is 27 cm from the incisor teeth where it is crossed by the left main bronchus the fourth and the last constriction is 38 cm from the incisor teeth where it is pierced the diaphragm let's learn about the relations of the esophagus now we are going to see the cervical part of the esophagus here anteriorly the trachea and right and left recurrent laryngeal nerves are here and posteriorly you can see the longus coli muscles and the vertebral column both the side it have the lobes of the thyroid gland on the left side you can find the thoracic duct now come to the thoracic part of the esophagus anteriorly small part of trachea left main bronchus right pulmonary artery and the pericardium with the left atrium are here posteriorly we can see the vertebral column and the thoracic duct esophagus vein and the descending thoracic aorta when we look at the right side we can see the right lung with right pleura right vagus and the esophagus vein are here on the left side we can see the left lung with the pleura arch of aorta left subclavian vein thoracic duct and the left recurrent laryngeal nerves are here then we will move to the abdominal part of the esophagus the esophagus passes through the diaphragm by the opening which is formed by the right curse of the diaphragm and the esophagus lies in front of the left curse of the diaphragm from this opening anterior and posterior vagal trunk and the esophageal branches of the left gastric artery and veins are transmitted when they asking the questions about the blood supply of the esophagus or what else you should remember to write both the arterial supply and the venous drainage 
When we look at the arterial supply of the esophagus, the upper part is supplied by the inferior thyroid artery which is from the thyrocervical trunk and which is the branch of the subclavian artery. The middle part of the esophagus is supplied by the esophageal branches from the descending thoracic aorta. In the lower part or the abdominal part of the esophagus is supplied by the left gastric artery from the celiac trunk which is the branch of the abdominal aorta. Looking at the venous drainage of the esophagus, Blood from the upper part of the esophagus drains into the brachiocephalic vein then to superior vena cava. Middle part of the esophagus drains into azagos vein then to superior vena cava. From the lower end goes to the left gastric vein and then to portal vein and then the inferior vena cava. Here you can see the portosystemic anastomosis. Here you have some clinical important. When the liver cirrhosis occur portal vein will be under high pressure that will cause the backflow of the blood into the veins of the esophagus. Then the veins of the esophagus will dilate and form esophageal varices. And if the esophageal varices continues for a prolonged time, the vessels may rupture and cause a hemorrhage. Now we move to the limb drainage of the esophagus. Cervical part of the esophagus drains into the deep cervical nodes and the thoracic part is drained by the tracheobronchial limb nodes and the posterior mediastinal limb nodes and the abdominal part is drained by the left gastric nodes and the celiac nodes. Okay, then we will move to the nerve supply of the esophagus. It is supplied by both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. When we consider the sympathetic, upper part of the esophagus is supplied by the fibers from the middle cervical ganglia and the lower part is supplied by the upper force thoracic sympathetic ganglia and they are vasomotor nerves and when we consider the parasympathetic upper part is supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve and the lower part is supplied by the vagus here the vagus nerve form the anterior vagal trunk and the posterior vagal trunk Anterior vagal trunk consists mainly by the left vagus nerve as well as the posterior vagus nerve consists mainly by the right vagus nerve. Both are from the esophageal flexors you can see right here. These nerves are sensory, motor and the secretomotor nerves. When the esophageal stretch causes pain, thus pain is carried by the vagus and that pain referred to right arm neck and the right thoracic core. Now let's learn about the histology of the esophagus. So it's time to travel from the lumen to outer covering of the esophagus. Esophagus to have the four main layers like the GIT tract. When we consider the wall of the esophagus from inside to outside we have the mucosa layer then under the mucosa we have the submucosa then the muscularis propria and then the adventitia or the cirrhosa. When we consider the epithelium, there is certified squamous non-keratinized epithelium is here. Then the lamina propria and then the muscularis mucosa. The thickness of the muscularis mucosa will increase when we go down into the esophagus. In the submucosal layer, we have the mucous glands and the venous plexus. In the muscularis propria, upper one third of the esophagus having the striated muscles and the lower one third of the esophagus having the smooth muscle and the middle one third is having both the striated and the smooth muscle. And in the adventitia, which is the layer made up of loose connective tissue and the capillaries and the nerves. There is no serous covering in the intra-abdominal part of the esophagus. When we consider the muscularis propria, we have the inner circular layer and the outer longitudinal layer. But in the top of the esophagus, the outer longitudinal layer is not continuous. So that is covered by the inferior pharyngeal constrictor, which is attached to cricoid cartilage anteriorly. So these muscle layers, the secular and the longitudinal muscle layers, help to produce the contraction to propel the foot. Now, we will move to the clinical condition known as the Barrett esophagus. When we look at the gastroesophageal junction, we have the lower esophageal sphincter. 
there is the one the barrier for the food to enter into the stomach when we ingest the food that will come to the esophagus and then the lower portion and then the sphincter briefly relax and allow the food to enter into the stomach and then that will close and then the stomach secretions are occur and the digestion start if the lower esophageal sphincter is not closed properly the gastric content will backflow into the esophagus that is known as the gastroesophageal reflux you can see right here when the lower esophageal sphincter is not closed properly the stomach content will be reflux into the esophagus that is known as the gastroesophageal reflux if you look at the closer view when the gastroesophageal reflux occur normal stratified squamous epithelium is eroded and then new epithelial cell proliferation occur and stratified squamous epithelium is replaced by the protective type of columnar epithelium this metaplastic changes occur at the lower 3 cm part of the esophagus that may lead to carcinoma in later types right now we will move to the another clinical condition known as the achalasia cardia that is occur due to the neuromuscular incoordination when we take the food because of the deglutition reflex lower esophageal sphincter relax to open and allow the food to enter into the stomach if it is not relax food which we eat will accumulate in the esophagus and can't come to the stomach thus causes the dilated esophagus when we take the barium saloon test for the esophagus this is the normal esophagus you can see right here and this is the esophagus which is having the achalasia cardia this is the dilated portion of the esophagus here you can notice the red tail sign in the lower part of the esophagus now we all know about the anatomy of the esophagus and the histology of the esophagus but we should know the origin no so let's move to embryology we all know the dry germinal disc that you can see here when the embryo undergoes the lateral folding that will result in the formation of primitive body cavities and the primitive gut tube at the end of fourth week cephalic and the caudal part of the embryo forms the blind ending tube and will form the foregut and the hindgut respectively and middle part forms the midgut from the foregut respiratory diverticulum is formed on the ventral wall of the foregut by the formation of the tracheoesophageal septum trachea and the esophagus will separate if any abnormalities in the separation of the trachea from the esophagus will result in the formation of the tracheoesophageal fistula I hope you all get some idea about the esophagus. Please like the video and subscribe our channel. Stay tuned with my diaries.